Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Um, today, we're going to discuss uh, chapter seven, which was mood disorders and suicide. So mood disorders are those in which extreme variations in mood, either high or low, are the predominant feature. Unipolar depressive disorders are those in which a person experiences only depressive episodes. Bipolar and related disorders are those in which a person experiences both depressive and manic episodes. Major mood disorders occur at almost the same rate as all the anxiety disorders taken together. Rates for unipolar major depression are always much higher for women than for men, as well as individuals in lower socioeconomic groups and those who have high levels of accomplishments in the arts. Today we'll discuss characteristics and treatments for uh, the mood disorders. So there are several types of mood disorders. Mood disorders involve severe alterations in mood for long periods of time. The first and most common is depression, which usually involves feelings of extraordinary sadness and dejection. And the next, mania, is often characterized by intense and unrealistic feelings of excitement and euphoria. So unipolar depressive disorders are disorders in which a person experiences only depressive episodes. Bipolar and related disorders are disorders in which a person experiences both depressive and manic episodes. Episodes are a term that's used to describe brief instances of mood disorders. These can be anywhere from months to years. Um, a depressive episode occurs when a person is markedly depressed or loses interest in formerly pleasurable activities, or both, um, for at least two weeks, as well as other changes in appetite, sleep, or feelings of worthlessness. A manic episode is a mood episode in which a person shows markedly elevated, euphoric, or expansive mood, often interrupted by occasional outbursts of intense irritability or even violence, particularly when others refuse to go along with that manic person's wishes or schemes. A hypomanic episode occurs when a person experiences abnormally elevated, expansive, or irritable mood for at least four days. In addition, the person must have at least three other symptoms similar to those involved in mania, but to a much lesser degree. Mood disorders occur with alarmingly frequent, alarmingly alarming frequency at least 15 to 20 times more they're 15 to 20 times more frequent than schizophrenia um, for example at almost the same rate um, they occur as almost the same rate as all of the anxiety disorders taken together um, major depressive episodes also known as unipolar major depression is the most serious mood disorder and its incurrence has increased um, significantly in the last decades. Um, the lifetime prevalence rates of unipolar major depression are nearly 17%. Ranges for unipolar major depression are always much higher for women. It's usually about a two to one ratio, uh, women to men. And this is found cross-culturally. Bipolar disorder is much less common. The lifetime risk for developing uh, classic bipolar disorder is less than 1%. So nationally representative surveys of U.S. residents suggest that mood disorders occur less frequently among African Americans than among European white Americans and Hispanics. Um, Native American depression rates are relatively high compared to other groups. Rates of unipolar depression in um, are inversely related to socioeconomic status, and elevated rates of mood disorders are found in individuals who have high levels of accomplishments in the arts. Um, this figure shows the annual prevalence of mood disorders using data collected through household surveys in 17 different countries as part of the um, World Health Organization's Mental Health Survey Initiative. So diagnostic criteria for MDD require that a person must be in a major depressive episode and have never had a manic, hypomanic, or mixed episode. 
Depression is often recur a recurrent disorder. Um, individuals who have major depressive disorder may relapse, which means they experience a return of symptoms within a fairly short period of time, or it is recurrent. Um, this just means that uh, it refers to an onset of a new episode of depression um, after the cessation of the last one. This occurs in approximately 40 to 50% of people who experience a depressive episode. The onset of unipolar depressive disorders uh, most often occurs during late adolescence up to middle adulthood. However, reactions may begin at any time of life from early childhood to old age. So the specifiers of depression refer to the different patterns of symptoms or features of the disorder. Um, and these are them. Um, so we have major depression with melancholic features. Um, so the characteristic symptoms would be three um, of the following symptoms, either early morning awakening, depression worse in the morning, uh, psychomotor agitation or retardation. Um, so for example, people with major depressive disorder tend to either pace a lot, they can't sit still, or they walk very slowly, they talk very slowly. Um, there's also either um, a loss of appetite or weight, excessive guilt, um, and qualitatively different depressed mood. With psychotic features, this just refers to hallucinations or delusions, um, along with other uh, typical symptoms. Uh, depression with atypical features uh, refers to mood reactivity. So mood tends to brighten to positive events. Um, and then you might have weight gain or increased, increased appetite. Hypersomnia, um, which means you're uh, sleeping more than usual. Um, lead in paralysis, which just means your arms and legs feel heavy, um, like you're, they're made of lead. Um, it also might make it feel like you're kind of walking through water or quicksand um, because everything just feels so heavy. Um, and then being very sensitive to interpersonal uh, rejection. And then catatonic features um, just refers to immobility of motor function. Um, so this can also be mutism um, or failure to be able to speak and rigidity. Um, so sometimes this might mean that you, the individual will be in a pose for a long period of time that might look uncomfortable, but they don't move. Um, and then with seasonal patterns, so uh, at least two or more episodes within the past two years. Um, and this usually happens in fall or winter. And this is because there is not a lot of sunlight in fall or winter. Um, and then full remission at the same time of year, which is typically spring and summer, where the sunshine is out um, in full force. So persistent depressive disorder was formerly called dis dysthymic disorder or dysthymia and is characterized uh, by a persistently depressed mood for most of the day um, for more days than that for at least two years. Um, one year, this can be one year for adolescents or children. Individuals must have at least two of the uh, following six additional symptoms when depressed. Um, and you can see uh, DSM box in the text for um, all of those symptoms. Uh, persistent depressive disorder is quite common with a lifetime prevalence that's estimated between 2.5 and 6%. The average duration is around four to five years, but can last for 20 years or more. Chronic stress increases severity of symptoms, and persistent depression often begins during adolescence with over 50% of those who present for treatment having an onset before the age of 21. Other forms of depression include bereavement and postpartum depression. So bereavement refers to the loss um, and the grieving process. So Bowlby identified four phases of normal response um, to the loss of, a, loss of a spouse or a close family member, which includes um, phases of numbing and disbelief, 
yearning and searching for that um, deceased person, disorganization and despair, and reorganization. In bereavement, depression uh, symptoms tend to take tend to peak at around two to six months after the loss. And the two-month bereavement exclusion um, that was uh, included in DSM-4 is no longer included in DSM-5, um, where you have to have this for um, more than two months. In the past, it was believed that postpartum major depression in mothers was relatively common, uh, but more recent evidence suggests that only postpartum blues are very common. Um, symptoms include changing mood, crying easily, sadness and irritability, and often um, liberally intermixed with happy feelings. These symptoms occur in as many as 50 to 70% of women within 10 days of giving birth. Hypomanic symptoms are also frequently observed and are mixed with more depression-like symptoms. There is a greater likelihood of developing major depression after postpartum blue blues, especially if they are severe. Hormonal readjustments and alterations in serotonergic and noradrenergic functioning may play a role in the onset of postpartum blues and depression. So there are several biological and psychological causal factors associated with uh, unipolar depression. Um, first, there is a moderate genetic risk where mood disorders um, approx are approximately two to three times higher among blood relatives um, of per people with clinically diagnosed unipolar depression than in the population at large. Uh, the monozygotic twin of a person with unipolar depression is twice as likely to develop unipolar depression as is a dizygotic twin. About 31 to 42 percent of the variance in liability is uh, due to genetic influences. One gene that's implicated in depression is the serotonin transporter gene. Um, so, of course, we see dysregulation of neurotransmitter sy systems being associated with depression. Uh, much of these focus on two neurotransmitters of the monoamine class, norepinephrine and serotonin. This led to the monoamine theory of depression. However, there has been a failure in research to support this hypothesis. The theory posit posits that um, there is a deficiency in monoamines. So um, we know that uh, you see efficacy in serotonin, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which then um, suggests that there is a deficiency in uh, the amount of serotonin within the uh, synapse to bind to those uh, postsynaptic receptors. Um, a number of integrative theories have been proposed that include a role for neurotransmitters, but um, not alone. Um, rather, they interact with um, other disturbed hormonal and neurophysiological patterns and other biological rhythms. Abnormalities of um, hormonal regulation and immune systems are also associated with depression. So we see blood plasma cortisol levels being elevated in 20 to 40% of outpatients with depression and 60 to 80% of hospitalized patients with major uh, severe depression. The elevations in cortisol may be due to a failure in the feedback mechanisms. Um, and this has actually been tested with a drug, dexamethasone. Uh, recent evidence suggests that dexamethasone uh, non-suppression may be a general indicator of mental distress rather than being specific to depression, because you do see that in other disorders like post-traumatic stress disorder um, and other anxiety disorders. Next, approximately 20 to 30 percent of patients with depression um, who have normal thyroid levels show dysregulation of the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. Using drugs to increase thyroid hormones um, can lower depression in these individuals, and people with hypothyroidism often become depressed, um, and approximately 20 to 30 percent of patients with depression who have normal thyroid levels show a dysregulation of this axis. 
When considering neurological changes, studies have shown that damage to the left but not right anterior prefrontal cortex often leads to depression. Clinicians may be able to use this to identify people at risk for an initial episode and recurrent episodes. Abnormalities were detected in several other brain areas in patients with depression, including the orbital prefrontal cortex, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, the anterior cingulate cortex, and the amygdala. Sleep and other biological rhythms are often disturbed in individuals with depression. Recently, findings have been linked to more general disturbances in biological rhythms. Patients who are depressed have early morning awakening, um, which also is linked to uh, differences in cortisol because cortisol is one of the uh, main players in waking you up in the morning. Um, also periodic awakening and difficulty falling asleep. Uh, changes in the circadian rhythm in patients with depression also include drastic changes in mood, appetite, and uh, social interactions. Exposure to sunlight and seasons also has an effect on mood. So like we discussed a few slides ago, seasonal affective disorder um, is a disorder where depressive episodes occur during the fall and the winter months. Um, but the therapeutic use of light therapy is very um, useful in this population, but light therapy is also useful in uh, populations of individuals with depression who um, aren't su suffering from seasonal affective disorder. Um, so it has been suggested that normal fluctuations in ovarian hormones account for the sex differences in depression. However, studies yield inconsistent results. It's possible that there's a causal association though um, some studies suggest that women have greater genetic vulnerability to depression than men, but other studies have not supported this idea. Um, you also see uh, very distinct sex differences in the HPA axis functioning um, in uh, healthy individuals, and you also see differences based on these in um, individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder or depression. So um, it might not just be ovarian hormones or it could be um, the way ovarian hormones interact with other um, systems as well. So as a lot of you discussed in your dis first discussion questions, stressful life events are important factors in the development of depression. Um, stressful life events involved in precipitating depression include things like loss of a loved one, serious threats to important relationships or to your occupations, or severe economic or health problems. Um, stress of being a caregiver to a spouse or a family member with a debilitating disease such as Alzheimer's disease is also known to be associated with the onset of um, both major depression and generalized anxiety disorders in caregivers. Severely stressful life events play a causal role in about 20 to 50 percent of cases of major depression. Uh, minor events may play more of a role in the onset of recurrent episodes than in the initial episode. Vulnerability factors, including genetics, living in poverty, and chronic uh, life stress also um, are involved. There are also personality and cognitive diathesis factors in developing depression. So neuroticism or negative affectivity and introversion play roles in the development and maintenance of depression. Early life adversity is also a diathesis for depression. Uh, family turmoil, parental psychopathology, uh, physical and sexual abuse, and other forms of intrusive, harsh, or coercive parentings are also risk factors for developing depression. Okay, so now we'll move on to some theories of um, how depression uh, develops. So according to Beck's cognitive model of depression, certain kinds of early life experiences can lead to the formation of dysfunctional assumptions that leave a person vulnerable to depression later in life if certain critical incidents like stressors activate those assumptions. Once activated, these dysfunctional assumptions can trigger automatic thoughts, which in turn produce depressive symptoms, which then further fuel the depression, depressive automatic thoughts. These dysfunctional beliefs or depress depressogenic schemas predispose a person to depression. They're thought to develop during childhood and adolescence as a function of one's negative experiences with uh, parents and significant others. 
They're activated by current stressors or depressed mood, creating a pattern of negative automatic thoughts. This results in the negative cognitive triad, um, which consists of the self, the world, and the future. Beck's theory of depression has gotten mixed results in research. Some studies suggest that those with high levels of dysfunctional attitudes and high stress are more likely to develop major depression than those with low stress or low dysfunctional attitudes and high stress. Okay. So two other theories of depression are the helplessness and hopelessness theories of depression. These theories are associated with studies that have found um, learned helplessness in laboratory dogs. Um, so these uh, studies would um, involve dogs and stressing dogs out, um, mainly by foot shocks. And if they can't find a way out of the environment, they usually give up. And that's where we um, get the learned helplessness theory. Um, the reformulated helplessness theory proposes that a pessimistic attributional style is a diathesis for depression. Attributions are the internal, external, global, specific, and or stable, unstable um, factors. People with pessimis pessimistic attributional style have a vulnerability or diathesis for depression when faced with uncontrollable negative events. There have been mixed results in testing whether this causes depression. Uh, though many studies uh, do demonstrate that depressed people do indeed have more pessimistic attributional styles. The hopelessness theory of depression is a revision of the reformulated helplessness theory. Um, there is a hopelessness expectancy where one has no control over what will happen and, something, and they think something bad will happen. In this theory, the internal-external dimension is not important to depression. It has been proposed that uh, depression-prone individuals not only tend to make global and stable attributions for negative events, but also tend to make negative inferences about other likely negative consequences of the event and negative in inferences about the implication of the event for the self-concept. Initial research supports this con uh, conceptualization. The ruminative Response style theory of depression focuses on different kinds of responses that people have when they experience feelings and symptoms of sadness and distress, and how their differing response styles affect the course of their depression. Rumination involves a pattern of repetitive and relatively passive mental activity. Those with negative cognitive styles tend to ruminate and are more likely to develop depression. And lastly, um, we have the interpersonal effects uh, of mood disorders. So uh, lack of social support and social skills deficits are related to depression. Um, there's a high correlation between marital dissatisfaction and depression um, for both women and men. Marital, marital distress increases relapse for depression. And parental depression puts children at ri uh, high risk for many problems, but especially depression. Okay, so moving on. <clears throat> Bipolar disorders are distinguished from unipolar disorders by the presence of manic or hypomanic episodes. Bipolar one includes at least one manic or mixed episode and bipolar two includes hypomanic episodes but not full-blown mania. Uh, cycles between hypomania and depression are signs of cyclothymia. Cyclothymic disorder is a less serious version of the full blown bipolar disorder. It refers to the repeated experience of hypomanic symptoms for a period of at least two years. Individuals with this disorder are at a greatly increased risk of um, developing full blown bipolar or bi one or bipolar two disorder later. Sorry. There we go. Uh, bipolar 1 disorder is distinguished from major depression um, with, by the presence of mania. A mixed episode is characterized by symptoms of full-blown uh, 
manic and major depressive episodes for at least one week, either intermixed or alternating rapidly every few days. In bipolar 2 disorder, a person does not experience full-blown manic or mixed episodes, but has experienced clear-cut hypomanic episodes as well as major depressive episodes. It's equally or somewhat more common um, than bipolar 1 disorder, and estimates are that about 2 to 3 percent of the U.S. population will uh, suffer from one or the other disorder. Um, and here we see the age of onset um, typically uh, in adolescence or young adulthood, but pretty late adolescence um, typically. Uh, and about three times as many days are depressed as hypomanic or manic. Um, so research indicates that major depressive episodes in people with bipolar disorder are more severe than um, those seen in unipolar disorders and also cause a more, ro a more of a role of impairment. Some antidepressant drugs used to treat uh, unipolar depression may actually precipitate a manic episode in patients who have yet, um, as of yet, undetected bipolar disorder. Uh, and rapid cycling, which occurs in 5 to 10 percent of patients, um, is just when you have uh, the rapid cycling of a depressive episode, manic episode, um, very quickly. 24% uh, of patients relapse within six months, and 77% have a new episode within four years, um, and then 82% within seven years. There are several biological causal factors associated with bipolar disorders. First, there's a genetic predisposition. Approximately 8 to 10 percent of first degree relatives of a person with bipolar 1 illness can be expected to have a bipolar disorder compared to 1 percent in the general population. Genes account for about 80 to 90 percent of the variance in uh, the development of bipolar 1 disorder. However, this may be a polygenic transmission um, as precise genes have not yet been identified. The monoamine hypothesis of unipolar disorder has been extended to bipolar disorder. Um, so we see increased levels of dopamine um, being associated with manic symptoms. Serotonin activity appears to be low in both depressive and manic phases. The HPA axis is associated with bipolar disorder as well. Uh, cortisol levels are elevated in... Um, bipolar depression, but usually not elevated during the manic episodes. Many bipolar patients have subtle but significant abnormalities in the functioning of the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. Um, thyroid hormones can precipitate manic episodes in patients with bipolar disorder. Next, uh, PET imaging has shown variations in the brain glucose meta metabolic rates in depressed and manic states. Uh, PET scans reveal that blood flow to the left prefrontal cortex is reduced during depression and increased in certain other parts of the prefrontal cortex during mania. Several recent reviews suggest that there are deficits in activity in the prefrontal cortex um, in bipolar disorder. Uh, the basal ganglia and the amygdala are enlarged in bipolar disorder but reduced in size in unipolar depression. Uh, the decreases in hippocampal volume found in unipolar depression are usually not found in bipolar depression. Increased activation in bipolar patients in subcortical brain injury regions um, involving emotional processing have also been found. There are also dysregulations with sleep where during manic episodes, patients with bipolar disorders tend to sleep very little, um, sometimes one to three hours a night. In depressed states, patients tend towards hypersomnia or they sleep too much. So psychosocial factors are similar to those seen in depression. Uh, so this, these are things like stressful life events, poor social support, and negative personality traits and cognitive styles um, play a role in bipolar as well.
So symptoms of mood disorders vary across cultures. In Western cultures, the psychological symptoms of depression are prominent, whereas they are not prominently reported in non-Western cultures, such as China and Japan, where rates of depression are typically relatively low. Though, as Asian cultures have incorporated Western values, um, there have been rates of uh, spikes in the rates of depression. Adolescents from Hong Kong were shown to have higher rates of depression than adolescents in the United States uh, in recent years. Prevalence rates for mood disorders also vary a great deal across countries. The 12 month prevalence of mood disorders varies from about 0.8% in Nigeria to 9.6% in the United States. Research is beginning to explore whether psychosocial risk factors for mood disorders operate across culture as well. Some initial evidence uh, that factors like rumination, helplessness, and pessimistic attributional styles are associated with risk for depressions in other countries like China. So there was a rapid increase in the treatment of depression from 1987 to 1997 and a modest increase since 1998. Between 98 and 2007, there was a decline in the reported use of psychotherapy, although um, the use of antidepressant medications have remained relatively stable. Um, the first category of antidepressant medications developed in 1950s, um, and these were the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, or the MAOIs. Um, this drug has many dangerous side effects and interactions with food consumed in a normal diet. Um, one thing you'll probably, uh, which is familiar, will be uh, M -O -M -M MAOIs and grapefruit. Um, you can't um, eat the two at the same time um, because it could cause uh, issues with your heart. Um, so because of this, usage has decreased significantly since the 1950s. Um, and sparked the uh, development of new, safer drugs. Um, from the 1960s to the 1990s, the antidepressant of choice was tricyclic antidepressants. Um, however, we've started focusing more so on selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs. Um, but recently, a new atypical antidepressant like Wellbutrin, uh, has become popular because they have fewer side effects and are more effective with d severe depression. Um, a typical course of treatment with antidepressant drugs usually require about three to five weeks to take effect. Um, about 50% of individuals uh, do not respond to the first drug that is prescribed. It takes a while to get it right, uh, which can be detrimental um, if each drug is taking three to five weeks to um, take effect. Um, so because of this, many people discontinue use of the drug um, because it takes too long, it has undesirable side effects, and once you start feeling better, you might think you don't need the drug any longer. Um, and doing stopping the drug prematurely uh, might result in relapse of depressive symptoms. Approximately 25% of patients continuing to receive medication during the maintenance phase of treatment uh, show a recurrent recurrence of MD, major depressive disorder as well. About three quarters of those in a manic episode show at least partial improvement on lithium. Some unpleasant side effects can um, be seen such as lethargy, cognitive slowing, weight gain, decreased motor coordination, and um, different gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, Long-term use is occasionally associated with kidney malfunction, um, which might result in kidney damage. Compliance is sometimes a problem because of the side effects. Um, Anticonvulsant drugs are often effective in individuals who don't respond well to lithium. Um, and the risk for attempted and completed suicide was nearly two to three times higher for patients on anticonvulsant medications than for those on lithium. Um, so there are um, pretty detrimental side effects uh, for some of these drugs. 
Alternative treatments also show effectiveness in treating depression. Um, severely depressed patients who present an immediate and serious suicidal risk uh, would be most appropriate for electroconvulsive therapy. Complete remission of symptoms occur for many patients after about six to 12 treatments um, if the treatments are administered frequently like every other day. However, varying levels of amnesia may persist. Um, and it's also found to be uh, effective in um, treating manic uh, episodes. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, is a non-invasive technique allowing focal stimulation of the brain in patients who are awake. Brief but intense pulsating magnetic fields that induce electrical activity in certain parts of the cortex are delivered. Many studies have shown um, TMS to be more effective than antidepressants without the side effects of ECT. Um, at UNLV, we have a faculty member who is doing TMS studies, not for depression, though. Um, so that's pretty cool if you want to get involved in research on campus, um, working with TMS. Deep brain simulation has been explored as a treatment approach for individuals with refractory depression who have not responded to other treatment approaches, such as medication, psychotherapy, and uh, electroconvulsive therapy. It involves implanting electrodes in the brain and then stimulating that area with electrical current. So this is obviously pretty invasive and not very commonly used. Uh, bright light therapy was originally only used in seasonal affective disorder, but is also effective in non-seasonal depressions. Um, so cognitive behavioral therapy focuses on here and now problems rather than the more remote and causal issues um, that psychodynamic psychotherapy often addresses. It teaches people to systematically evaluate their dysfunctional beliefs and negative automatic thoughts, as well as to challenge their underlying uh, depressogenic assumptions. It is at least as effective as pharmacotherapy when delivered by a well-trained cognitive therapist. Mindfulness cognitive-based um, therapies involve training in mindfulness meditation techniques aimed at developing a patient's awareness of unwanted thoughts, feelings, and sensations so that they no longer automatically try to avoid them, but rather learn to accept them for what they are, simply, um, which are simply thoughts occurring in the moment rather than a reflection of reality. Um, behavioral activation treatment is a relatively new and promising treatment for unipolar depression. It focuses intensively on getting patients to become more active and engaged in their environment and their interpersonal relationships. It may be as effective as more traditional cognitive therapies, and a modified form of um, cognitive behavioral therapy may be as effective um, for bipolar disorder as well. Interpersonal therapy um, has not been extent as extensively studied as CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy, um, nor is it as widely available. Studies here suggest um, that it is effective for treating unipolar depression. It seems to be as effective as medications or cognitive behavioral treatment. It focuses on current relationship issues, trying to help the person understand and change maladaptive interaction patterns. Um, it has also been adapted for treatment of bipolar disorder by adding a focus on stabilizing daily social rhythms. Family and marital therapy focuses on stressors in the patient's life um, that may lead to recurrent depression and necessitate a longer treatment. For married people who have unipolar depression and marital discord, marital therapy is as, is as effective as cognitive therapy in reducing unipolar depression in the depressed spouse. Um, even without formal therapy, a great majority of patients with mania and depression recover from a given episode within um, a year. Okay, so now we're going to move on to a very sensitive topic. Um, depression is the disorder that's most commonly linked with suicidal behavior. Um, suicide is the act of taking one's own life. Approximately 90 to 95% of those who die by suicide have a history of at least one psychological disorder. 
Individuals with two or more mental disorders are at an even greater risk than those with one. Suicide is currently the 15th leading cause of death in the world, accounting for about 1.4% of all deaths. Most people who commit suicide are ambivalent and are alone and in a state of severe psychological distress and anguish. Women are, more, are significantly more likely than men to think about suicide and to make non-lethal suicide attempts, but men are four times more likely than, than women to die by suicide. Suicidal thoughts and behaviors increase in prevalence starting at around age 12 and continue to increase into the early to mid-20s. The rate of suicidal death um, follows a similar pattern, followed by a peaking in middle age, which is around 44 to 55 years old, then a slight decrease in leveling off for the remainder of the lifespan. The suicide rate for white men in the United States shows a dramatic increase by age 75. There is also an increased risk among adolescents and young adults. This is a period during which depression, anxiety, alcohol and drug use and conduct disorders show prevalence. There is also an increased availability of firearms. Exposure to suicides, especially celebrities um, through the media also impacts the increase during the, uh, this time. College students are also at risk because of the combined stressors of academic demands, social interaction problems and career choices. Um, and so, at the very end of this lecture, I've included a few phone numbers. Um, if you do, you or your friend um, or someone you know is showing signs that you can have um, access to help. Um, the rate of suicide varies dramatically in different parts of the world. Um, is using uh, data from the figure here um, from the World Health Organization. More people die each year um, by suicide than other forms of violence. Um, so you can see that. Um, there are several biological and psychosocial factors related to suicide. The concordance rate for suicide in identical twins is about three times higher than fraternal twins. There's also been findings that suggest that reduced serotonergic activity plays a role. People with one or two copies of the short allele for the serotonin transporter gene are at a heightened risk for suicide following life, uh, stressful life events. There is also growing support for association between the additional uh, serotonergic gene variants and suicide attempts. Psychosocial factors associated with suicide include a family history of psychopathology, child maltreatment and family instability, um, and other uh, chronic stressors. Early experiences and biological vulnerabilities increase the risk of personality traits such as hopelessness, impulsiveness, aggression, pessimism, and negative affectivity. Other symptoms that seem to predict suicide more reliably in the short term with patients with major depression include severe anxiety, panic attacks, severe anhedonia, global insomnia, delusions, and alcohol abuse. People who have a strong implicit association between self and death of, um, are at an elevated risk for future suicide attempts. Two theoretical models of suicidal behavior include the diathesis stress model and Joyner's model. Um, Joyner's interpersonal psychological model of suicide suggests that perceived burdensomeness and thwarted belongingness interact to produce suicidal thoughts and desires, and it is only in the presence of a third factor, the acquired capability for suicide, that a person has the desire and ability to make a lethal suicide attempt. In order to treat suicide, clinicians focus on treating the underlying disorder through therapy and antidepressants. Crisis intervention is another available treatment. 
The primary objective of crisis intervention is to help a person cope with an immediate life crisis. This helps people regain their ability to cope with their immediate problems as quickly as possible. An emphasis is usually placed on maintaining supportive and often is highly, um, highly directive contact with a person over a short period of time, um, usually one to six contacts um, for that. Um, and also helping the person realize that acute distress is impairing his or her ability to assess the situation accurately. Um, and to see that there are better ways to deal with the problem and then helping that person see the present um, distress and emotional turmoil will not be endless. Suicide hotlines have been effective and available since the 1960s. These are usually staffed primarily by non-professionals, um, but these individuals are trained and supervised by psychologists and psychiatrists. Um, so here are a few resources. Um, first is the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Um, this is a 24-7 hotline um, with people who are there to take your call and help. Um, and then I've included two other uh, resources um, on campus. The first is the uh, Counseling Center that's in the um, gym building, the recreation, recreation center. There's the phone number there and also the practice. Um, these are really great resources if you are feeling um, depressed or um, stressed with school. Um, they're there to help you. Um, and if you need any other community resources, I will be happy to find those for you as well. Um, so that's it for this lecture. Um, I'm still grading exams, but I'll get those um, up for you shortly. Um, and yes, have a great weekend.